uh, good morning. Um, as uh, Dr. Scowley said that today I'm going to be talking about uh, evaluation of patient, uh, uh, older patient who comes to the emergency room uh, with altered uh, mental status. Uh, and again, as Dr. Scowley said that this program is supported by a grant we received uh, from the Reynolds Foundation. So, just let's look at uh, two or three uh, cases. This is an 80 year old woman who is brought to the emergency room by her daughter because the patient was noted to be confused when the daughter was visiting her after work. Patient lives alone and has a past medical history of spinal stenosis, osteoporosis, falls and mild cognitive impairment. She has fallen multiple times in the past six months but has had no fractures. She visited her primary care physician two days ago complaining about severe back pain and difficulty sleeping at night. She was prescribed uh, cyclobenzaprine which is a flexural uh, muscle relaxant, uh, low dose uh, amitriptyline and PRN oxycodone. Uh, physical exam including a neurological exam is unrevealing which of the following is the most likely diagnosis. Uh, a, opioid overdose due to excessive use of oxycodone, subdural hematoma, medication induced delirium, alcohol intoxication and dementia related sundown phenomena. Okay. Okay. All right. I think most of you are right. Good. Okay, now this is an 82 year old patient who is brought to the emergency room with acute change in mental status. You utilize confusion assessment method, a CAM to screen for the presence of delirium. Which of the following meets the CAM criteria for delirium? Uh, a is acute onset, altered level of consciousness and Im memory impairment, uh, B is acute onset disorganized thinking and inattention. C is acute onset altered level of consciousness and executive dysfunction. A D is acute onset inattention and hallucinations. And E is acute onset hypervigilant and disorganized thinking. So, which one of these meets the criteria for confusion assessment method to diagnose delirium? Okay. So, Okay, so I think we are a little bit all over the place with this one and we will you know talk about that uh, criteria for diagnosing uh, delirium. Okay, so last question 78 year old patient is brought to emergency room with altered mental status and is diagnosed with delirium. Which of the following diagnostic tests is not appropriate for initial evaluation of the patient? Uh, CBC electrolytes, blood sugar, urine analysis and CT of the head. Okay, so, so the answer is CT of the head. But how many of you actually order CAT scan of the head when patient comes to you with altered mental status? Okay, so quite frequently and you know in fact I think the studies have shown that the yield is quite poor when you uh, order CT of the head patient especially when they do not have any focal neurological findings. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my focus today is going to be more on delirium. Uh, so the learning objectives are that you know I will talk about a systematic approach in assessing an older patient presenting with altered mental status. We will talk about uh, that if we do not recognize uh, delirium there are negative consequences of that. Uh, describe distinguishing features between delirium and dementia identifying risk factors of delirium and then we will talk about diagnosis and management of delirium uh, in the emergency room setting. When we look at uh, patients presenting with altered mental status in the emergency room it is quite common and I think as the population is aging more and more patients are presenting uh, to emergency room uh, with altered mental status or cognitive impairment. In fact studies have shown that more than quarter of older patients are cognitively impaired. In fact, you know some studies have shown that it could be up to 40 to 50 percent that older patients who come to the emergency room they have altered mental status and unfortunately it is recognized only about 28 to 38 percent of the time. So, if you look at the um, your evaluation or 
uh, documentation uh, for the emergency room records that only about quarter to one third of the patients actually are recognized that they have cognitive impairment. Since today we are going to focus on delirium, we can broadly categorize uh, altered mental status, uh, patients who have delirium or, cog or patients who have cognitive impairment without delirium. Um, and when we look at patients uh, who are in the emergency room uh, with a diagnosis of delirium, approximately 10% of the pa older patients um, in the emergency room suffer from delirium. And the studies have shown that the identification is really poor, uh, that only 16 to 36% of the cases actually are diagnosed to have delirium. So I think it's really important that you know, we have a systematic assessment of mental status, and I'll talk about some tools which you can use uh, for diagnosis of delirium, keeping in mind that emergency room, you know, it's a very fast pace uh, place, and you cannot be spending too much time, uh, for example, doing mini mental status examination, which takes about 10 to 12 minutes to do. So we really have to look at uh, some tools which are quick, uh, but at the same time making sure that we don't miss uh, the diagnosis of delirium. So when we uh, talk about mental status, uh, it has two components. You know, one is that level of consciousness or arousal, and that's something uh, which you can assess by observations. You know, especially uh, during history taking, and then there is cognition, which is a content of consciousness. So let's look at level of consciousness. Uh, first, uh, consciousness is the ability of a person to be able to receive information, uh, process that information, and then act upon it. A normal level of consciousness consists of a patient who is alert and attentive. And these are patients, you know, when you're taking history, they are able to focus, they are able to sustain and shift uh, their attention. But at the other extreme of the level of consciousness is patients who are comatose. Uh, who actually don't respond uh, to stimuli, and I, I won't be talking about uh, those patients, but uh, there are patients who are inattentive, uh, but they can be hyper alert as well as lethargic. And uh, we'll talk about that lack of attention is a very important feature uh, of diagnosing delirium. And you can have patients who are hyper vigilant or hyper alert, but you can also have patients uh, who are lethargic, and those are the patients where you actually miss uh, the diagnosis uh, of delirium. And the second is cognition, and if you look at domains of cognition, it's orientation, uh, attention, memory, uh, recent memory, and remote memory, uh, executive function. Um, as far as orientation is concerned, I'm sure you know all of you check about patients' orientation. Uh, attention is very important, and sometimes that's not something uh, we pay that much attention to. And attention refers to a person's ability to focus on a given task, such as naming of the months backwards, uh, naming of the or the days of the week backward or doing a digit span test, you know, which is that you randomly um, let's say digits uh, to the patient uh, with different numbers, and a patient should be able to repeat up to five numbers uh, normally. And that uh, would be a test for attention, which could be done pretty quickly. Uh, memory, uh, new and old memory and executive function. So the question is, you know, what kind of tool we should use uh, in the emergency room settings to get a quick idea as to whether the patient has problems uh, with content um, in terms of cognition. Um, uh, I talked about mini mental status. First of all, it has become a copyright. Uh, so you really cannot use a mini mental status examination without getting uh, permission. Um, we can use a test which is called mini-cog, which is a drawing of a clock and also three item recall. But again, I think it's a little harder in the emergency room uh, to have patients asking them drawing a clock. Uh, the other test which have been used commonly in the emergency room is called a six item screener. And how many of you are familiar with that tool? 
Okay, not many. Uh, so it's a really a simple test, and what it involves is uh, three items uh, with orientation, which I think you already ask patients, and then the other three items are related to recall. So you know, so it has total of six points, and it has been shown that if you have three or more errors, uh, it it has the same sensitivity and specificity as you would see in a patient where you do mini mental status examination with a cutoff of 23. Uh, so in terms of doing a quick mental status examination, you know, you definitely assess for level of consciousness and there are many tools which you can use uh, for assessing uh, level of consciousness. I mean, you use the uh, AVPU and then I'll also talk about a tool which is called uh, Richmond Agitation Assessment Scale. Uh, which can be used very quickly to assess patients' uh, level of consciousness. And then you can use a six item screener. So all it is is that asking patients questions related to orientation and then asking patients questions uh, related to recall. So that should be uh, pretty quick. Um, it has been recognized by the, actually the emergency medicine community that we are missing uh, the diagnosis of delirium or we are not doing proper uh, cognitive assessment in the emergency room. You know, this was actually published uh, recently um, uh, that the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine, they came up with quality indicators uh, for evaluating uh, patients who have altered mental status are doing cognitive assessment um, in the emergency uh, room setting. And this is their recommendation that number one is that if an older adult presents to the emergency department, then the ED provider should carry out and document a cognitive assessment such as an indication of level of alertness and orientation or an indication of abnormal or intact cognitive status or document why a cognitive assessment was not done. So the second thing is that once we find out that there is impairment of cognition or there is impairment in the level of consciousness and that should really raise a red flag. So the next question is that we really need to find out whether there has been acute change in mental status. So here it's quite important that we really need to uh, find out what the baseline mental status of that patient is. And sometimes that's hard because you have patients coming to the emergency room, there's no family, uh, so you may have patients coming to from the nursing home, you have really no idea what the baseline uh, cognitive functioning is. So it is quite important that we need to find out what the baseline mental status of the patient is, whether the changes which are occurring in mental status, they are acute or is it something uh, which is chronic. So we may have to, you know, really pick up the phone and call the nursing home or speak to the family members and asking what the baseline mental status of the patient is. And if you don't have any history uh, or you're not able to obtain any history from the family or uh, the nursing home, then you really need to treat those patients as if they have had acute change in their mental status. So the second is that if an older adult is found to have cognitive impairment, then the ED care provider should document whether there has been an acute change in mental status from baseline or at least document an attempt uh, of doing so. So those are you know, the two quality indicators which actually the emergency medicine community is looking at that what do we do with pac older patients when they come with uh, change in mental status or the basic uh, cognitive assessment uh, which we need to do. So it's really important to differentiate between delirium and dementia because that's I think a common mistake uh, which is made um, and we all know that uh, delirium is something which is acute um, and dementia is a chronic uh, process. The duration for delirium is hours to days uh, whereas dementia is months to years. Uh, course of delirium uh, is fluctuating because sometimes you can have a patient um, who may be hyper alert but then they could be lethargic. So the uh, mental status uh, may fluctuate whereas in patients with dementia uh, it's slowly progressive. Attention is a very important feature for diagnosing de delirium and it's poor in patients uh, 
um, who have delirium, uh, but it's generally unaffected till a patient in is in severe stages of dementia, and then you may have problem uh, with attention. Uh, consciousness is impaired in patients with delirium, uh, where it's uh, clear unless a patient is late in the course uh, of uh, their illness. And both may be associated with memory impairment, orientation difficulties, hallucinations, and delusions. And we also know that dementia is a very strong risk factor for uh, delirium. So, you have patients who have uh, underlying dementia and then they develop acute change in their mental status and they suffer from delirium. That's why I can't emphasize enough that it's really critical that we need to know what the baseline cognitive functioning uh, of that patient is because that really helps us in terms of uh, what their diagnosis is. I just mentioned, uh, want to mention a word about uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, and that is sometimes hard to distinguish uh, from patients with delirium. Um, and uh, approximately uh, 15 to 25 percent of the patients may suffer from dementia with Lewy bodies, and it is characterized by rapid decline and fluctuation in cognition, attention, and level of consciousness. So, these patients sometimes may be hard to distinguish uh, from delirium. You can also have visual hallucinations in patients who have dementia with Lewy bodies, but uh, these patients generally do have Parkinsonian motor symptoms such as cogwheeling, shuffling gait, stiff movements, and reduced arm strength swing during walking. So, you can differentiate uh, these patients, uh, for example, from patients with Alzheimer's disease because generally patients with Alzheimer's disease do not have any Parkinsonian uh, type of symptoms. So, delirium in the acute care setting has multiple names, uh, acute confusional state, acute brain failure, uh, sundowning, encephalopathy, uh, ICU psychosis. So, there are many terms which are used uh, for uh, patients who are diagnosed to have delirium. You know, in fact, we, uh, um, I think it was about a year ago, we actually looked at the emergency medicine records from our institution. Um, and as I mentioned that uh, the incidence of delirium is around 10 percent, and we looked at all the diagnoses like altered mental status um, or acute confusional state, you know, several synonyms which can be used for delirium, and there were only 2 to 3 percent of the patients who were actually diagnosed to have uh, delirium. So, so we are seeing that uh, we are not diagnosing these uh, patients, and there is underdiagnosis of patients uh, with delirium. So, what are some of the negative consequences of delirium? It, it is actually a powerful prognostic marker associated with in-hospital and long-term mortality. And it also has been shown that uh, patients who suffered from delirium when they were discharged from the emergency room setting, uh, the three-month mortality of patients with delirium was much higher as compared to patients who did not uh, have delirium. So, it does have uh, negative consequences. It also poses a significant threat to the quality of life. Uh, patients who suffer from delirium have accelerated functional and cognitive decline, and they have longer length of stay. And it's said that it costs more than 100 billion dollars in direct and indirect charges uh, taking care of patients uh, with delirium. So, what are some of the diagnostic uh, criteria for delirium? And these are DSM-4 uh, criteria for delirium. And number one is, as I mentioned, uh, level of consciousness, that there is disturbance of consciousness with reduced ability to focus, sustain, or shift attention. So, it is a disorder of attention, uh, a change in cognition, or the development of a per perceptual disturbance that is not better accounted for by a pre-existing established or evolving dementia. The disturbance develops over a short period of time and tends to fluctuate during course of the day, and there is evidence from history and physical examination or laboratory findings that the disturbance is caused by direct physiological consequences of a general medical condition. So, you can see from the criteria, it does not say that there is any structural damage uh, to the central nervous system. That is why this condition actually is potentially reversible, because uh, there is no structural uh, damage. 
As far as clinical features of delirium, I mean, we talked about acute onset fluctuating course in attention, disorganized thinking, altered level of consciousness. You have cognitive problems. Uh, people can have visual uh, hallucinations, altered sleep wake cycle, and emotional disturbances, you know, like fear, uh, paranoia, restlessness, irritability. Uh, so, patients can present with uh, these symptoms. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, pre presentation, uh, you can have uh, patients who are hyper alert and you can also have patients uh, which are lethargic or hypo alert. Uh, hyperactive patients are easier to recognize because they are the ones who are creating problems, you know, whether uh, pulling uh, their IVs. Uh, so, these are patients who are agitated, combative, restlessness, maybe ha having hallucinations. So, they actually come to our attention a lot more quickly as compared to a lethargic patient which is not giving us any problems. Uh, they are more likely to go unrecognized and it has been shown that um, in the emergency medicine setting it's the hypoactive delirium and the mixed type of delirium uh, which is that's a most uh, common way of presentation uh, for patients who are coming uh, in the emergency. About three quarter of the patients actually will ha either have mixed delirium or they have hypoactive uh, type of delirium. What are some of the risk factors? Uh, when we look at risk factors uh, for delirium, we can actually classify into two categories. One are uh, predisposing factors and these are the factors which are uh, present pre-hospitalization uh, and then they are precipitating factors. That what is it that we do to our patients um, in the hospital uh, that they actually then uh, develop uh, delirium. So, it is important to recognize what the predisposing factors are because that should really alert us that if this patient does not present with delirium, they are actually risk uh, at risk for developing delirium. So, can we put some prevention uh, things in place for uh, patients to prevent delirium and that is something I think it is hard in the emergency room to do, but it has been shown uh, that in inpatient setting, once we identify patients at risk for delirium, if we put prevention protocols um, in place, which are quite uh, you know simple or more uh, common sense uh, type of protocols that we can actually reduce the development of delirium uh, by about 40 percent and that has been tested. Um, in randomized trials and it was developed uh, by Dr. Inoue uh, at Yale and she had uh, six uh, interventions uh, in place and it was basically making sure the patient are well hydrated, they are mobilized, they have their glasses, they have their hearing aids, um, they, we are doing uh, reality um, orientation uh, uh, to patients. Uh, so, these are simple things that we can put in place which are actually can prevent patients uh, from having uh, delirium, especially when they are admitted to the hospital and patients who are at uh, high risk. Uh, so, other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, there is an interaction uh, between uh, predisposing factors and precipitating factors that how they interact with each other in terms of patients developing delirium. So, if you have a patient uh, who is very vulnerable that, you know, they have uh, for example, older patients, patients with dementia, they have multiple comorbidities, uh, they have uh, functional uh, problems. These people are at high risk for developing delirium and sometimes just a simple thing that you know giving patient for example, a sleeping medication uh, which has anticholinergic uh, side effects could actually tip them uh, towards delirium. Whereas, a patient who has uh, less of these predisposing factors or you know who is relatively uh, intact, they are functional, they do not have any uh, underlying dementia. It is going to take a lot of um, so called you know noxious stimuli for them to go into delirium. So, that patient may have to have severe sepsis or some major problem before they would develop delirium. But you see a lot of older patients who are very vulnerable that even re removing them from their environment, patients not having uh, their glasses or hearing aids, patients having little bit of dehydration or electrolyte problems and the way of presentation of their illness is that they develop delirium. And the other important thing to keep in mind is that delirium actually is multifactorial and that is I think important uh, for you guys in the emergency room 
uh, setting because you don't want to have premature closure of the case that you know you find out one thing which is wrong with the patient and you think that that is what is causing them to have uh, alteration in the mental status where there may be few things which are going on with the patient you know they may have urinary tract infection maybe they are on medications uh, which are um, have anticholinergic side effects so we really need to look at all those factors uh, which can actually contribute uh, to delirium because delirium is generally uh, multifactorial so if we look at uh, predisposing factors and some of those i have already mentioned uh, advancing age male gender uh, dementia number and severity of comorbid conditions uh, functional impairment patients who have hearing or visual problems patients who are on uh, many medications especially psychoactive medications uh, alcohol abuse and that's something we don't think of normally with our older patients but they uh, do have alcohol uh, problems dehydration malnutrition depression i mean these are all risk factors uh, predisposing risk factors for developing of delirium and then the precipitating factors you know the, almost any illness can actually present as delirium and you can see that some of these are actually life threatening uh, conditions so you really don't want to miss the diagnosis of delirium because that is an opportunity uh, for for us to see that there may be uh, some underlying uh, life threatening conditions which are actually contributing to delirium so infections you know inadequate pain control trauma electrolyte disturbances uh, hepatic or renal failure hypoglycemia uh, medication changes. I think any time a patient comes with altered mental status, I think the first thing you want to find out is what medications they are taking and did they, was there any change in medications? You know, even uh, some of the over the counter medications uh, like Benadryl or um, H2 blockers, uh, they could actually cause uh, confusion um, in an older patient. So, central nervous system uh, issues, uh, cardiopulmonary issues. Uh, and nitrogenic events that, you know, making sure, yes. Just question. In regards to one of the questions earlier, and it said that it's head CT was not a required test. Right. I mean, how can you say that if you have CBA and hemorrhage versus the CBC, anemia is not that there per se, which would be the only thing I would be looking for on a CBC for, except for a white count to support either UTI or pneumonia. Or right, right. So you are saying that why uh, we are saying that head CT should not be done? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, it's a, it's a debatable issue. That's why I asked you guys that how many of you actually order head CT, and it seems like a lot of you order head CT. But there have been studies done actually in the emergency room setting where they have seen the yield for head CT. That what did they find out? Um, and the yield is much better if you have patient who has alteration in the state of consciousness, uh, if they have history of head tra uh, trauma, uh, history of falls, or they have focal neurological signs. So I think what I'm trying to say is that every patient does not need a head CT. We really need to do a thorough physical examination, but it's again a clinical judgment. You know, I couldn't say that don't do head CT in patients with delirium, but it has been shown in the studies that if you have those conditions, and also uh, if you find out that, you know, you're not able to, there's no obvious cause of delirium in a patient, then you do end up, uh, you have to do a head CT. So I think if you keep that in mind that uh, certain conditions, if they are there, uh, then the yield for the CT is going to be much better rather than actually ordering uh, head CT in every patient in the emergency room. Okay. Um, I just want to emphasize um, on medications, uh, uh, you know, sedative hypnotics, narcotics. I mean, this is a very complicated issue, this delirium. You know, for example, a patient doesn't have uh, a proper pain management, they could actually present as delirium. Whereas we know that when you p give patients narcotics, that could actually cause uh, acute confusion. So it's, it's, these patients are quite challenging uh, and they are not easy uh, to take care of, but I think we just need to keep in mind that we, we need to be aware of this and we don't want to miss the diagnosis of this uh, in the patients. And especially uh, drugs which have anticholinergic side effects, uh, uh, drugs which we give patients for urinary incontinence, you know, anti-nauseans, I mean, that's something 
Uh, these things are frequently prescribed um, in the emergency room. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants, maybe we don't use them that much anymore. Um, antipsychotics um, and pro-motility uh, agents. That these drugs can all have anticholinergic side effects and they can cause confusion, especially in patient who is very vulnerable to start with. Um, as far as the diagnosing delirium is uh, concerned in the emergency room, um, there are many tools which can uh, use for assessment of delirium. I think the most common tool or the one which actually has been validated in the acute care setting and also in the emergency room setting is called CAM, which is confusion uh, assessment method. And it's really based on uh, the um, DSM-4 criteria which I mentioned in terms of diagnosis of delirium. Um, unfortunately, again, it does take uh, 7 to 10 minutes uh, to do confusion assessment method which can be a little bit of a challenge um, in the emergency room setting. And the other instrument which is actually being studied in the emergency room setting is called CAM-ICU. And th that takes only about 2 minutes. Uh, to do in the emergency room and I'll talk about that a little bit more. I mean, others are a delirium symptom interview, delirium rating scale. There's another scale which is called nurses, nursing delirium screening scale where uh, they have a checklist of uh, the criteria for delirium and that could be useful. But the, the two common instruments um, which have been used, I mean one has been validated in the emergency room and other is being studied in terms of uh, validation in the emergency room setting is a CAM and CAM ICU. So what are some of the criteria for confusion assessment method? Um, you know, you need to have history of acute onset of change in patient's normal mental status and fluctuating course. Uh, lack of attention, which is an important feature of delirium. So you need to have one and two, uh, and then either three or four, either alteration in the state of consciousness or a disorganized uh, thinking. Um, and this instrument has been uh, tested, and it does show the sensitivity is about 94 to 100 percent, and specificity is 90 to 90. Uh, 5 percent. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about CAM ICU because I think that may be an easier instrument to use in the emergency room setting. Um, and this scale actually is based on the degree of consciousness. Uh, there is visual recognition to test attention and short term memory. Um, head nodding and head movements as responses because originally it was used in an ICU setting in patients who were mechanically ventilated that you know if they could not give you verbal response uh, then this um, instrument is much more uh, useful and sensitivity and specificity is comparable uh, to the basic CAM. And um, I'll show you actually a video of uh, a CAM being done and recently they have just altered the criteria a little bit uh, and I'll talk about that because I think that makes it much easier for us to utilize this instrument. Hi, my name is Dr. Wes Ely, and I'm here in a medical intensive care unit to demonstrate an assessment of a patient on mechanical ventilation using the confusion assessment method for the ICU, the CAM ICU, for determining whether or not a patient is delirious. Ma'am, I'm going to ask you a few questions. My name is Brenda, and I'm one of the nurses here in the ICU. I'm just going to ask you a few questions to see how clearly you're thinking. How many fingers am I holding up? Can you hold up that many fingers? Very good. Can you hold up that many with the other hand? Perfect. Have you had any unclear thinking today? Good. A lot of our patients in the IC, ICU do have unclear thinking, but that's great that you don't today. Can you squeeze my hand? Very good. I'm going to say some letters, and I want you to squeeze my hand only when I say the letter A. Okay, let's practice. A, good. Here we go. S, A, H, E, V, A, A, R, A, T. Perfect. 
I'm going to show you some pictures. I want you to pay attention because I'm going to show you some more after I show you this first set. Can you see them if I hold them right here? Can you see that? That's a boot and a dog, a knife, a pair of pants, and a paintbrush. I'm going to show you ten more pictures. Five are going to be new and five are these same ones I just showed you. Did you see a fork in the first set of pictures? Did you see a boot in the first set? Best guess. Okay. Did you see a paintbrush? Did you see a cat? Did you see a dress? Did you see a toothbrush? Did you see a shoe? Did you see a knife? Did you see a dog? Did you see a pair of pants? Very good. You got 100% right. Now I'm going to ask you four questions. They're really simple, just yes or no questions. Will a stone float on water? Does one pound weigh more than two pounds? Are there fish in the sea? And can you use a hammer to pound a nail? Very good, 100%. Okay, so it's quite uh, can you squeeze my hand? simple. <laughs> Okay, so th this is what they use for CAM ICU, and you can actually get, uh, you know, this information is not copyrighted, and there's open access to this. So the first step, because they just changed uh, how uh, CAM ICU to be done in terms of saving actually time uh, for us. So the first thing is to um, step one is checking the level of consciousness, and they use a scale which is called a Richmond agitation sedation uh, scale um, and uh, again you know the, this is a scale which could be used in the emergency room setting uh, very easily so if you have again it uh, you know talks about patients who are agitated whether they are combative very agitated agitated restless and zero is alert and c calm a patient uh, who spontaneously pays attention to the caregiver then you have patient who is drowsy light sedation moderate sedation and then they exclude patients who have deep sedation or unarousable. I mean, patients who are stuporous uh, and comatose, uh, then you don't proceed uh, with CAM ICU. So if you have RAS is greater uh, than three or equal uh, to minus three, then you proceed to do CAM ICU. So the first thing is checking uh, for level of consciousness because you know that if you, if patient has alteration in level of consciousness, then you've already met one criteria for diagnosing delirium. So all you need now is the patient needs to have acute onset um, or fluctuating course. And one of the other change CAM ICU uh, made was that the original CAM required that you had acute onset as well as fluctuating course, whereas CAM ICU requires you can have acute onset or fluctuating uh, course. So you really need two other criteria, acute onset or fluctuating course, and the other one is uh, inattention. So it's not that uh, difficult to, to do. So once you assess the level of consciousness, uh, then you ask the question whether there's been acute change or fluctuating course. So if it's uh, positive, <coughs> then you uh, t test the patient for attention. and, and I like uh, CAM ICU because there are actually objective ways that how you can actually test uh, for attention and also for disorganized thinking. Uh, so the attention is, as you saw in the video, uh, you ask the patient, you know, save a heart, uh, and they have to uh, uh, answer that when they hear the word uh, or the letter A. Um, and if they, uh, if that is, uh, if the, the greater than two errors. Um, and they have altered level of consciousness, then you have CAM ICU positive. So if you have a patient who doesn't have alter alteration in the level of consciousness, then you proceed to whether they have uh, disorganized thinking. And some of the questions which were shown, uh, three or four questions, you know, that tell us whether 
the patient has disorganized thinking or not. So, it is relatively easier uh, to do in an emergency room setting, it takes only a uh, couple of minutes uh, to do this uh, type of uh, diagnostic test. In terms of you know what is the etiology of delirium, why actually patients develop uh, acute confusional state or delirium, uh, it, we exactly do not know, but it has been hypothesized that there is widespread imbalance of neurotransmitters and disruption of synaptic communications uh, resulting from either from medication, side effect of medication or hypoxemia, metabolic derangements they call, uh, they cause global impairment of cerebral metabolism resulting in decreased synthesis and release of neurotransmitters. Uh, patients who have uh, systemic inflammation that causes activation of microglia and leads to increased uh, cytokine levels, because it has been shown that patients of delirium may have higher levels of cytokines. And some studies support the notion that uh, CNS blood flow may be disrupted uh, during delirium. So, what do we do with a patient when they um, come of, uh, in the emergency room who have um, diagnosis of delirium? Uh, again, you know, know, knowing the time course of mental status change is important. Baseline mental status, I think I have stressed enough on that. Any history of trauma, fall, medication review, any recent changes, any history of alcohol abuse. So, physical exam, I think the main thing is, you know, we want to make sure that the patient is not unstable and you want to stabilize the patient uh, in an emergency medicine setting. So, checking their vital signs, emphasizing on your logic, including mental status, cardiovascular and pulmonary examination, looking for signs of infection, because infections are a very common uh, cause of delirium. In fact, studies have shown that urinary tract infections, pneumonias are very common uh, cause uh, for delirium in older patients. Um, looking for dehydration, uh, you know, you want to make sure that the patients are not hyp hypoxic, they are not hypoglycemic, because that could present um, as delirium. So, you want to check that rapidly. Uh, some of the lab tests um, I mentioned here, uh, CBC electrolytes, renal and liver function test, urine analysis, chest x-ray, EKG. Um, if you suspect myocardial ischemia, any arrhythmias or to assess prolongation of QT interval. And depending on the clinical scenario, consider head CT a lumbar puncture, if you are suspecting somebody has infection or you know signs for meningeal irritation, blood cultures, toxicology screen and, and thyroid uh, testing, because hypothyroidism could present um, as delirium. So, depending on what you find on physical examination, you know you do some basic workup and then other tests uh, on an as needed. Uh, basis. So, when a patient comes for acute change in mental status and you know one we talked about delirium. So, what are some of the other uh, possibilities I think which you uh, have to keep in mind. I think we already talked about structural CNS process that you know whether somebody had a stroke or they had intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, another condition to keep in mind is non-convulsive status epilepticus, because patients may come as confused. So, knowing that they have history of seizures may actually push us in that direction. And then psychiatric illnesses, you know somebody could have acute psychotic reaction and that these patients are a little hard to distinguish from delirium. And I think you all know that before you send them for psychiatric admission, you actually have to rule out that there is no medical illness, which is causing them to have um, any uh, psychiatric manifestations. And I think the complicated thing is that, you know, all the three uh, things I listed in addition to delirium, they could actually present as delirium. So, the patients um, actually are quite uh, complex. Uh, when they uh, present with acute change in mental status. So, the question is you know what do we do once we diagnose patient has delirium. So, the treatment is really search for the underlying cause and treat it. And um, as I uh, mentioned before that many time uh, delirium is multifactorial. So, if you just find one thing make sure that you do not stop uh, investigating that there could be other reasons which could be causing delirium. We want to create a safe environment for the patient um, and the staff in terms of you know when we should use psychotropic medications in these patients and these are really reserved for patients in distress due to severe agitation or psychotic symptoms that we do not want to uh, give psychotropic medications uh, to patients unnecessarily. And if you have to use 
uh, psychotropic uh, medication, then aim for monotherapy, lowest effective dose, and tapering as soon as possible. And antipsychotics are uh, the treatment of choice. In fact, uh, you know, the studies have shown not that there has been many randomized trials or head-to-head -head comparison, but Haldol is supposed to be the drug of choice uh, in taking care of patients uh, with delirium and benzodiazepines should be avoided and they should be reserved only for patients who present with withdrawal from alcohol or sedative uh, hypnotics. Uh, so, how much of Haldol uh, you can use? Uh, I mean, I guess that again depends on, you know, how old the patient is. I mean, a general guideline is that patients who are uh, older, frail, we should not be using uh, too much of Haldol. I mean, we recommend, uh, the studies have shown that 0.25 to 1 milligram IM or PO evaluate effect in 30 minutes to an hour and then you can administer additional doses until agitation is controlled and the clinical endpoint should be an awake but manageable uh, patient. And then some people do recommend that you should actually have a maintenance dose that half the loading dose and you can taper that uh, over the next uh, two to three days. Um, uh, I'm sure that uh, you guys use IV Haldol in the uh, emergency room also uh, for older patients. It should be used carefully um, and it is recommended that you should do baseline EKG prior to uh, giving patient IV Haldol to see that they don't have QT uh, prolongation. Uh, atypical antipsychotics can also be considered as an alternative. Um, lower rates of extra pyramidal signs with the atypical um, uh, antipsychotics, you know, risperidone, olanzapine, or Seroquel uh, could be used for patients. Uh, but again, these need to be reserved only for patients who are severely agitated uh, and it's really interfering with their medical uh, care because we, uh, the treatment for delirium is really uh, treating the underlying cause. As far as non-pharmacologic management of uh, delirium, I mean, we always want to take a look at medications that none of the medications is causing uh, effects. It's good idea to actually involve uh, family members uh, so the caregivers can actually be with the patient because sometimes just having a different environment causes them to have a more uh, agitation. So it's always a good idea that he, we can involve family members to provide them with support, making sure you know they have their glasses, hearing aids, uh, attention to patient concerns and fears, uh, remove any lines or devices that they don't need. You know, if they, we don't need to catheterize the patient, don't catheterize them. Um, so, uh, avoid any uh, restraints uh, uh, as much as possible. I think the other just point, last point I want to make that uh, these patients, uh, when you see them in the emergency room, uh, you have to have a low threshold for admission of these patients because, you know, there may be many reasons that why patients um, are becoming delirious. I mean, initially it may not be that obvious. So it's not a good idea to discharge these patients because it has been shown that the three-month mortality is much higher in patients who were discharged from the emergency room. So you have to have low threshold for admission. Uh, delirious patients uh, discharged from ED more likely to return and be hospitalized when admitted to the hospital admission to a specialized geriatric unit. Now, we just started the ACE unit um, at Stratford, so it's a good idea to place these type of patients uh, in the ACE unit because, you know, then we can take care of some of the uh, issues uh, which uh, come up in terms of, you know, not restraining patients, making sure they are mobilized, making sure that they are uh, hydrated. And regardless of patient disposition, delirium detected in the ED should be communicated to the physician at next stage of care. And that's something, you know, we've actually found that we have some research projects going on delirium and we did see that first of all the diagnosis of delirium is not made in the emergency room and even if the diagnosis is made in the emergency room, it's not actually communicated to the floor. So it's really important that uh, we communicate uh, to the uh, floor that okay, you know, this patient has delirium and what's actually their, was their baseline uh, mental status before uh, they came to the hospital. Yes. Understand that we have a low threshold for admission in general for the elderly. It seems like just because they're so fragile. To right. With. But now with Medicaid and Medicare moving more towards not paying for admissions, delirium is not a payable 
observation, or admission diagnosis, according to our case managers in the ER. So unless they have delirium with um, UTI, it doesn't actually get taped for it. Do you have any recommendations to what we can do to maybe sort of bolster our chart to not necessarily get the paper, but yeah. you know what I mean? Just right, right. Do something when we obviously know these patients should be put in the hospital, right. but at the same time we have our case managers who are yelling at us to discharge them home. I'm really surprised that uh, uh, because you know this is actually uh, um, um, uh, it was originally going to be included in one of the never events in the hospital and it is one of now the quality indicator by which the care of the elderly is judged uh, in a acute hospital setting. So I think some of it is probably lack of awareness. Uh, I mean I will follow up on that that why uh, they think that somebody who has acute change in their mental status uh, uh, should not be admitted to the hospital. Uh, I will follow up on that. I mean, that's, I'm surprised that uh, this is something they say, you know, unless there is a lot of people get confused with what is delirium and what, what is dementia. I mean, I can. I mean, a lot of times I'll have a true delirium right, patient right. who's very acutely agitated, acutely confused, and the, the whole month of can we do this, can we do this, can we do this, trying to get the patient a payable diagnosis to admit right. because delirium, even if you write delirium, is not a payable diagnosis. Encephalopathy used to be a payable diagnosis, which I think was part of the reason why the ER doesn't diagnose delirium okay. because it doesn't get paid for. Mm -hmm. But now encephalopathy is also off the list of payable diagnosis by itself. So okay. we're sort of in this yeah, no, I, I totally understand. I mean, I will follow up on that, maybe speak to the, uh, you know, the physician who does the utilization review. I mean, uh, Kennedy does have now a full-time physician who reviews yeah, that. And, and, you know, a lot of our gait instability apparently now gets paid for if we document a failed get-up-and-go test, which is something we never really did before. So I don't know if there's something that okay. maybe, no, you know I, I mean? it's Right. Yeah, I mean, whether, you know, CAM positive or something yeah, that something. we need to put it in there to substantiate our diagnosis of delirium. Now, that's a good point. I'm glad you raised that, and I will uh, definitely follow up on that. Uh, okay, so again, you know, I talked about that communication is very important, and that is, again, uh, one of the other quality indicator which the uh, uh, Society of Academic Emergency Medicine has recommended that if an older adult presenting to the, an ED is found to have cognitive impairment, that is a change from baseline and is discharged home, uh, then the ED provider should document the following, support in the home environment to manage the patient care and a plan for medical follow-up to just make sure that these patients uh, don't get lost. Um, and just want to conclude that in any patient with change in mental status, consider delirium as a possible diagnosis. Consider altered mental state to be acute until proven otherwise. That if you don't have a history uh, on a patient, then just treat them as if there's acute change in mental status. And delirium is very common in the emergency department and is often missed. And missing delirium can result in a loss of a window of opportunity to diagnose and treatable reversible medical and surgical conditions that could uh, present as delirium. Okay, thank you.